Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today we have Christine Duraki with us. Christine is a highly sought after certified yogi with over 500 hours of teaching teacher training, cosmetologist, and certified Ayurvedic consultant who helps people, especially women, to be beautiful inside and out. Christine approaches her Ayurvedic consultation with you, and together you will explore your health, history, lifestyle, and detect any imbalances that may be affecting your overall wellness with compassion. Finding the root cause of imbalances through empowering questions and answers and creating a fearless goddess personalized plan. Christine works largely with women 40 and older, as well as menopausal women, and women of all ages. She currently lives in New Jersey with her three lovely children. Christine, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. So happy to be here. It's a wonderful time. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm I'm feeling happy that it's summer. I I love the summer. Yeah, right before the show, we were talking about, uh, I'm in New York, you're in New Jersey, and it's over 90 degrees right now for both of us. Yeah. I took my dog out and I think my dog was melting so (laughs) I lived in Arizona for five years and I can know I know the feeling of melting (laughs) yeah (laughs) for my listeners who don't know you yet and I'd love for you to share you know your story I found that each of us is the hero of our own story and we've Mm -hmm. experienced challenges setbacks and adversities that we've overcome to help us get to where we are today so if you would please Mm -hmm. share with us what is your hero story So for so many years, I I was sick and I just kept going to doctor after doctor trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And I got misdiagnosed and that went on for several, several years. And I got to the point I couldn't walk. I just, my relationships were suffering and I kept hearing the message, go to yoga, go to yoga. So I decided to listen to that you know, internal voice, which I wasn't listening to for a very long time. Mm. And once I got to my mat, and I just kept going back to my mat over and over, um, I started to feel better, not only physically, but also in my mind, you know, in my, my spirit, I wanted to do things again, I I felt more alive. Um, So I started to do my I did my first teacher training, because I really loved the, the teacher and um, she embraced me with such warmth and compassion. And I, I needed that. Um, so I also started to learn a little bit about Ayurveda and how that can really help heal you. And I started to, I just started to get better and better. So that was, you know, that was my biggest um, part of my, my journey was that I intuitively knew what I needed to do. And it was so different than what I was doing. So um, taking medicine and, you know, not not that medicine is always bad, but I was just overtoxing my my system Mm. Um, and really working out way too hard physically for my body. I was like beating up my body and um, all that like, that love and that support that came on my mat helped me so much more than anything else could have helped me. Yeah, there's a few things that you just shared that I really want to point out for the for the audience. You know, from the from just a health perspective, you know, something that Christine just alluded to, especially you know us East Coasters, but <laughs> across, at least anyone um, in the Western world in general has this kind of mentality almost kind of that they grow up in which is the go 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 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like the yin and the yang. And the yang is like that male essence, like the fiery, the go. Mm -hmm. But the yin is the more restorative, the nurturing, the, the slowing down. And so mm -hmm. just having that opportunity to say, what am I doing right now that's taxing me? You were, let's say, over working out too hard, overtraining. And so I used to do that as well. And so many of us, we do that. We think more is better. And then that actually can be very detrimental in our healing process. And it can actually prevent us from healing because the way it impacts the immune system and the nervous system and all these different things. And so with your background in Ayurveda, for anyone who's listening, who's not sure what that is, could you share your definition of that and what it means to you? Sure. In, um, Ayurveda is the science of life. Mm -hmm. And that means that it takes all the elements, the elements of nature, and we are made up of those elements. So those five elements are called then the doshas, the three doshas, which are vata, pitta, and kapha. And everybody has all of those elements within each other, within themselves, but each one of us is a little bit different. So you and I can both be pitta, vata, but your pitta might be much higher than mine or you know, much lower. And it, it says that attracts, attraction attracts like and opposites balance. So if you have a lot of um, that fiery en uh, energy, you're going to attract that, but it's not necessarily good for you. You might need to you know, step away and have that little bit of earth energy, which mm -hmm. would be kapha, you know, to balance. And so... It's, it's just like a very intuitive, it's a very intuitive medicine. I mean, it is the science of life, meaning that we learn as we go and we learn with nature. Yeah, yeah. And in my understanding, I, I don't know much, I don't know a lot about Ayurveda, but my understanding is it's, it's from India and I believe it's over 10,000 years old, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's a wonderful, um, you know, part of my training as a naturopathic physician was in traditional Chinese medicine, and that's at least 5,000 years old, and Ayurveda is, I think some of the TCM training is actually based in Ayurveda, <laughs> so it's really fascinating stuff, and just this idea of the balancing, you know, this harmonization, I, I think that what comes to mind, a lot of people listening to this podcast they're leaders, they're champions, they're high performers in their own regard, but sometimes we don't know when to hit the off switch. And I think that when we come from that space of the work hard, play hard kind of balance, it's like when I'm going to work, I'm going to go all in, I'm going to be on. But if I don't balance that, it's like when you go to a gym, when you go to a gym and you're lifting weights, you're, that's not when you build the muscle, that's when you break down the muscle. But if you right. just worked out all day, 18 hours a day, you're not going to get bigger. You're going to probably go to the hospital. <laughs> right. But you're it, just breaking down. There, yeah, there it's needs when to you that sleep restoring and, and right. resting and rejuvenating, that's where you're going to build back up. And so it's just, it, it's so wonderful to hear your journey and how you're, you're incorporating everything that you've learned. Now you mentioned that, you know, there was some sickness in the past and there was like misdiagnoses and no one really knew what to do. And what was that process like for you? Because I know that, you know, when I was practicing medicine full-time, as well as when I was a student in medical school, so many patients, that would be their story. You know, they'd come to see me or they'd come to see the school in the clinic there. And people would say, I've seen 20 doctors. No one knows like what's wrong. Or I've been diagnosed with these 15 things and I've been on all these medications and nothing's getting me better. And they would be very frustrated and understandably so. And so for anyone listening who's had a similar experience, what was it like for you and what lessons or messages could you share with them? Well, I was first diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and they put me on that really strong medication to treat it. And I, it started to make my stomach bleed. So actually that became a blessing though, because I had to go to the emergency room. Um, because if you, if your stomach's bleeding, it's, it's not a good thing. And <laughs> well, while I was there, <laughs> it's not. Um, I mean, I had to go to a hematologist. I went to, I, I mean, I went to every sort of doctor. Um, but when, when I was there, that is when they first found the indication that possibly I had Lyme disease. And then I went to a, um, another doctor that did treat me for the Lyme disease. And thankfully, I mean, 
because I, I, I was so sick. I mean, I literally couldn't walk down the stairs. They, they would need to, you know, they wanted to get me a wheelchair because I, I couldn't walk. I mean, they got to the point, they're like, your knees are shot. I was, I think I was 30 something years, like very young thirties that I was going to get two knee replacements because I just, I couldn't function. I had three young children and, um, I, I was, I, I was depressed. I mean, you know, if you think about when you're in your 30s, you, you're supposed to be alive and thriving and embracing life and enjoying your children and your whole family. Um, and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. So um, I was happy that I got diagnosed with Lyme because it started me to feel better. And Lyme affected all of my systems. It affected my thyroid. It affected my kidneys, my liver, and you saw this all in my blood work. So once I started to get that treatment, I was able to function a little bit better, but it already did a number of my joints and I didn't have the choice about not getting the, the knee, re knee replacement. So I had to do other things. I got some shots in my legs and everything turned around when I started to go to yoga. I mean, I, I can't. I can't say enough good things about yoga. It was a very slow process. I mean, it wasn't a quick fix by any stretch of the imagination because I had to rebalance my whole system. But because I chose that that route, it was so much more sustainable mm -hmm. than, you know, if I just did the Band-Aid method. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's there's so much there to unpack. And I think that, when, we, when we, we talked about earlier, you alluded to it, you know, medications in, in and of themselves, pharmaceutical drugs, they can be life-saving and they're wonderful yeah. tools when mm -hmm. they're indicated. And one of the challenges so often is the perspective that a lot of physicians have, unfortunately, with a lot of the training that's kind of predominantly done, it's not holistic in its nature in the sense that it doesn't see the body as interconnected, like one mm -hmm. giant super system. Everything's kind of separated out. And the challenge, like you said, is you might be on one drug that a prescription, a, a physician prescribed to you appropriately for what you had, but they didn't consider maybe an effect it would have on a different drug that you're on or that, you know, how it might impact a different system in your body. And then, like you said, you might be bleeding from it or you might have some you know, negative indication from it. But when we can see people holistically, as an example, you mentioned rheumatoid arthritis, and for anyone who's not familiar, think of it like an autoimmune condition that's inflammatory in nature in all the different joints of the body. And that's like a general way of thinking about it. And not always, but very often I have found autoimmune conditions have a mental and emotional component to them. And I remember working with patients who had been abused when they were children in many different ways, and their rheumatoid arthritis or different autoimmune conditions started in their 20s. And when I took them through a process of emotional release work and forgiveness work, their autoimmune condition went away. Now, mm -hmm. the thing is, that's not always the case because it depends on what the cause is. But when we can right. really take a step back and who, you know, whoever your physician is, whoever your healthcare provider is, are they looking at you as a whole person? Are they looking at you and not just saying, oh, you've got hepatitis, so you're like my liver patient? No, like you're a whole body. You're, you're, a, you're in my experience or in my belief rather, you are a spiritual being having a human experience. You have a body, you're not the body. And so from mm -hmm. that way of being, if we were to use that as a premise, you've got a whole story of life that led you up until this moment. And that's contributed to why things are the way they are right now. Dr. John Sarno, he wrote a book, I think it was in the 90s, but it might have been earlier, called Healing Back Pain. And he talked about how any pain that's still around six to eight weeks after the onset, after it first starts, is largely psychosomatic. It's largely in the mm -hmm. mind. And he would get people off their pain medications and heal them so often. And people would, now that he's no longer with us physically, people would read his book and they would apply his techniques and it would work for them. Mm -hmm. And so it, again, it depends on what the cause is, but all, all that to say, treating people holistically, like you said, yoga helped you get back into balance. Mm -hmm. And balance is the name of the game. It's, to me, it's like symptoms are the body basically yelling at you saying, hey, pay attention. Something's right. wrong. Something's <laughs> off. Something's out of balance. But in general, you know, we don't like to feel symptoms. And so we take medications. You mentioned the Band-Aid approach to suppress mm -hmm. it because we don't want to deal right. with it. But if you don't deal with it, it gets worse. 
But if you do what Christine did and she fed, it wasn't an, an, a quick fix. It was a long journey. But mm -hmm. I'm sure anyone who's taken that journey and is on the other side of it and feels so much better could tell you that it was worth it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, now every morning I sit, you know, do a check in with myself. Okay. What, what is my body saying to me today? Are there any symptoms, you know, asking for that actual feedback because our physical body is going to give us that feedback. And the thing about Ayurveda is it takes all of you into consideration. It isn't just, Oh, I have arm pain. Oh, I have foot pain. There's, there, it's all of you, you know, and that's yeah. just what you said. It's, it's the truth like you have to you have to look at everything you can't just look at the one symptom that you're having yeah and as it relates to you know your journey and i'm sure so many people who are listening because it can be a long journey and because it can be frustrating at times and there can be the highs and the lows and we think we're getting better and then we don't or we think you know we're in the we're in the low side of it and we're like nothing's working or maybe we're depressed maybe mm -hmm. for anyone who's going through those experiences right now if you could draw from your own experience and say, like, what are some messages you could share with them to support them on their journey, whether they're on a low or whether they're on their way up, back up? Sure. I mean, I had times that it, the symptoms came back, you know, when I was under so much stress, each one of my pregnancies, I, my body then afterwards was tired and then my symptoms came back, but I had those tools to know what I needed to do to get myself back into balance. And again, it wasn't, you know, a snap of the fingers, easy fix. It took, a, you know, it took a little bit of time, but it's like that soft nurturing that you have to give yourself and listening of what you, you actually need, you know, rather than going full force um, and killing yourself, you do have to step back and, you know, be a little soft and forgiving with yourself when, when you do, when something, when a symptom does show itself, you know? Mm. Something that you just said that I really love the, the idea of forgiving yourself. And another way that I might put it is having grace with yourself throughout your process. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was in medical school, hearing a physician, a teacher of mine saying, it's like, look, it took you 40 years to get to where you're at right now. It's not going to be gone overnight. <laughs> Exactly, right. <laughs> and, yeah. And if we can just come from that space of proper expectations might be a way of putting it where, yeah. okay, I might be in my thirties, my forties, my fifties, I could be younger, I could be older, but regardless, nothing that I'm experiencing now, pain, condition, symptom, whatever it is, just happened. It's built up over time and using an, an atropathic or an Ayurvedic kind of perspective, it's like the system has been out of balance and now it's adapted to try to still function uh, with that, like um, the non-optimal situation going on, it's trying to adapt and still do what it has to do. And our bodies are incredible that despite how unhealthy, let's say the average, at least American is, they still on average live to be about 78 to 82. That just shows how incredible and how resilient the body can be. But you may have a lot of symptoms in that experience. And so when we can just slow down and say, you know what, let, let me take care of myself. Let me have grace with myself in my process and realize it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time, but it'll be worth it because the time's going to pass anyway. So right. if I tell you, hey, it'll take you 10 years and you're 40, it'll take you 10 years to get back to where you want to be. And you might initially go 10 years with a lot of time. Okay, but 50 is going to, assuming you're, you survive, 50 is going to happen. Would you rather be 50 and be feeling great in your body or would you rather be 50 and still feeling sick or probably feeling worse? And when mm -hmm. you realize it from that perspective, it's like, okay, it's going to be worth it. And then just for me, it's like taking a, like a triangle approach almost of a mind, body, and spirit. And mm -hmm. you, mentioned, you mentioned journaling. I think you said that. What are the ways that we can speak to and, and support each of those legs of that triangle? You know, physically, mm -hmm. are you sleeping? Are you eating good food? Are you hydrating? But then like, right. this, are you in the sun? Are you moving your body? But then when it comes to the mental side, like you said, stress, stress can flare up so many of our health conditions. And I, I think this was a World Health Organization statistic, but I may be wrong on it. But the idea is that about 80% of um, chronic disease can be linked back to stress as one of the primary causes. And yep. it, it's, it's in the ballpark of that. If it's not spot on, mm -hmm. it's around there. And when we realize, wow, Okay, given that that's the situation, what am I doing 
to deal with that stress? What, what are my relievers? Am I going on nature walks? Am I exercising, which is an amazing way to get rid of stress? Am I speaking with friends and laughing? Am I journaling? All these different practices. I'd imagine in your situation, you took a very you know, holistic approach to combat everything you were experiencing. Would that be the case? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I also feel like your trigger where you're, you hold your, your stress or the thing that manifests as your illness is usually the same thing over and over. And it's usually because you were out of balance and you did, or you, you got yourself out of balance by doing something, whether, whether it was something that you thought was good and you overdid it, or you ate something that was bad or but it, it usually comes back in the same way. Do you find that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah. using like the metaphor of a building, let's say you have structural integrity. And so mm -hmm. if there's an area of the, of like, you know, um, sorry, I don't, I don't know the technical terms for these, the beams, you know, <laughs> that are supporting the weight. If there is areas of weakness, that's where a collapse would happen. That's where the weakness right. is, but the body is the same way. If you've got areas of weakness because of the maladaptations and injuries and all these kind of things, those are typically the areas that collapse first. Those are the areas that aren't as resilient right. and robust. And so, yeah, I've definitely seen that happen. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's good. Like that awareness in itself, I think, is a gift because then you, you, you know and you can do something about it when you don't have that awareness or, or that yeah, that awareness, I think, is, is a huge thing. Um, just like that I know when I get out of balance, it affects my knees. That was my weakest point in my, my body. And now I can say my knees are good. They're strong. And um, I'm, not, I'm not running my, you know, six to 10 miles anymore. I go for long walks and I love it. Um, but I know if my knees are talking to me, there's something that I did that didn't really relate so much to my knees, but that's where, that's where my body will talk to me the most. Yeah, something that you just said alludes to something you started with. You said, if my knees are talking to me, and then you said in the beginning, this idea of that voice that was like, you should do yoga, and we don't mm -hmm. always listen yes. to the voice. <laughs> right. No, I've definitely found that in my own life as well. And anyone who is listening to this podcast and they've heard different episodes, the first episode is where I share my story. And one aspect of it was for a period of time, ignoring that voice. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. thankfully listening to it <laughs> as it started to yell at me <laughs> and right. that I made the right choice for me in the life that I live now. But when we yeah. can slow down and say, okay, something's calling to me for a reason, like pain, mm -hmm. as an example, using it's an easy example, pain is your body calling out to you that something is not right? Something needs to be paid. You have to pay attention to something. So mm -hmm. it, like in Christine's situation, if I walk and my knees hurt, okay, something is going on either in the soft tissue areas, the, the ligaments, the tendons, the bone itself, the joint, something's going on there and that needs to be addressed. Otherwise it's not gonna get any better. But then it could also be a, a mental emotional side. You know, mm -hmm. like every day you wake up and you hate going to work. And it's like, there's that voice in your head of, do we really have to do this again today? Mm -hmm. And you might ignore that voice because you tell yourself, yeah, we got to do it. And you just go and do it. But that voice inside is always speaking to you. It's always right. trying to guide you back where you need to be. And if mm -hmm. a voice is really strong, my perspective would be that it's strong for a reason. It's yelling for a reason. You've been ignoring mm -hmm. it for a while. What could happen if you listen to it? And so from a pain perspective, it's a little bit easier. It's like, okay, let me pay attention to this. But from a life perspective, it's like intuition, that gut feeling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I um I it's funny. I don't know why we need to need to be yelled at. Like, <laughs> but I think we do. Like sometimes it gets to that point that we need to be yelled at and our body has to speak to us that fiercely for us to listen. I think an aspect of it is we, the world we live in today, because of technology, technology is amazing in so many ways. Mm -hmm. But similar, like with medication, like we talked about earlier, everything can be like, there's a perspective in medicine. The difference between a, a remedy and a poison is the dose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in that same kind of way, because of technology, the dose matters. And when you're so inundated from every direction with technology and with distractions, you can't hear 
what's going right. on on the inside. Because whether it be you're always listening to something, it could be a podcast, it could be music. A lot of a lot of times, people nowadays, I've seen a theme and a pattern of there's almost like a fear. It's not even conscious usually, but there's a fear of silence mm -hmm. because you know at some level that you're not on the path you're supposed to be on, and you know that you've kind of been ignoring some things that are really important. And so you distract yourself. And by distracting yourself, you don't hear that voice inside. Mm -hmm. But when you do finally get the silence, like for example, there's something called a sensory deprivation chamber or a float tank. And mm -hmm. people might be listening, you might have experienced, experienced this, they're beautiful. And there are these giant pods and they're filled with warm water that's about body temperature. And there's a lot of magnesium, like Epsom salt in there. So you can float in the water. There's no, and it's only probably like six, seven inches deep, but there's no fear of like falling in because if you float, but when you close the tank, you have the option of turning the lights off and turning the music off. And it's complete, like you're in the void. You're just there. And it's such a cool experience, at least for me. But mm -hmm. I know some people who hate that experience because the moment they're in silence, the voice in their head starts like screaming. And mm -hmm. it's very uncomfortable because they don't really want to deal with it. But again, if you don't deal with it, you will always have inner conflict. You'll always have that lack of peace. And from what I have seen, both in my coaching practice and back in my medical um, practice, this idea of if you don't address it, it's going to get worse. If you don't address it, it's, it's only going to yell so long. And then mm -hmm. at, at that point, the system starts to break down. So it's like, what are you ignoring? What are you afraid to deal with? What are you afraid to listen to or look at and see? But just yeah. by seeing it, the other side of that is a plan, something you can do. Like you mentioned earlier, very often when people have so many different diagnoses and misdiagnoses and people are like, I don't know what's going on with you. Part of the pain they experience, at least mentally and emotionally is, excuse me, what's going on? Like, I don't know what's happening. That unknown right. is very scary. Yeah. But then if someone actually says, oh, I've seen this before, this is what's happening. Whether it's there's one calm. thing, or there like, yeah. Yeah. there's a calm, oh, okay. We finally have a plan now. We know what we're going to be doing. We know what we're treating. We have a plan of attack, like all that kind of perspective in that same kind of way. It might be right. scary. I, I've had people that have told me, you know, I probably should go to the doctor and I probably should get some blood work. And it's been like 20 years since the last time. And I know I got a lot of things going on. I can feel it, but I'm afraid to go because I don't want to know. Right. But the people don't like uncertainty. <laughs> yeah. But that challenge there is, it sounds good on the surface. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you just got to put it off and you don't have to think about it. But then you might have been able to prevent something early that now will, will go on late stage because you waited so long. But if you do go and you get the blood work and you get the physical exam and they, and they let you know, this is what's going on. Now you can actually do something about it. You and now you can get, it, right? instead of being on the road to becoming sicker and sicker and more ill, now you're back on the road to health. Mm -hmm. And so that last aspect that I'd like to share before I send it back to you is whether it's an Ayurvedic practitioner like Christine, whether it's a naturopathic doctor, whether it's a functional medicine doctor, work with a healthcare provider who's going to treat you in a holistic fashion, is going to take everything into account because that's what's going to really bring your body back into balance and what's going to give you the greatest opportunity to heal. Because unfortunately, at least in the United States where we live, there's so many physicians, the majority, the vast majority, amazing hearted people that got into it for the right reason. The challenge is you only know what you know. You know what you're trained in. And depending on what that training entails, it's usually not in that holistic fashion. And so if you can work with somebody who's seeing you as a whole being, mind, body, spirit, the whole story, the traumas, the challenges, environmental toxicities and exposures, and all these kind of things, you dramatically increase the likelihood of A, getting an answer to what's really going on, because it's probably not one thing. It's a, like, it's a multifactorial type of approach, a lot of problems happening at the same time. Then you finally get back on the road to healing. We don't want you know, disease management. We actually want healthcare. We actually want you to get better and to heal. And you have to first be willing to look at it and then be willing to do something about it. And then like Christine said, it might be over the long term. So keep the consistency and the persistence knowing that you will get well, but it takes time to change it. Right, right. And it's a choice. I mean, it's, it's a, you're, you're choosing something. Are you choosing to ignore things or are you going to choose to know something so that the next choices are to make yourself better? 
you know? And you said something before about um, the silence. And one of the greatest gifts I think that we, everybody can give themselves every day is to meditate. I mean, I, I cannot say how life-changing meditation is. You know, you hear so much in the silence. Mm. So do you, don't you agree? <laughs> Absolutely. Do you have a type of meditation that you prefer that you can share with the audience? Um, no, I mean, when I meditate, I guess it just depends how I'm feeling that day. I usually start my day with my meditation. Mm. Um, and sometimes I'll end my day with meditation and do more like um, recapping of my whole day at the end of the day, like how my day went and just then offering gratitude and prayers. And when I start my day, it's um, I open it up to the universe, God, and and offering my prayers and gratitude, but then asking what I'm supposed to do today and how I'm supposed to show up and show me, show me, you know, what you got, what's the best thing that you have for me today and where should I go? You know, like those kinds of things. So, and then I just allow myself to sit there for anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes, depending upon how long I have. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I love meditating. Yeah, yeah, I, don't. <laughs> I could do it for an hour, but I don't. No, it's perfect. And something that I utilize that may benefit people who are listening. So if you don't meditate, it's not that you have to, you know, nobody has to. There's different ways yeah. of kind of incorporating what we're about to say. But just this idea of meditation, there's so much research behind it to show the way it impacts the immune system, the way it actually shifts the brain and like the composition of white matter and gray matter and all this <laughs> like the tissues in the brain. It's really cool. And think of it, we said this world of distraction, this world of kind of the fear of that silence. So when you meditate, instead of going outward, you're taking a moment to go in. And if you were to sit there, close your eyes. And in the beginning, if you're not used to it, you might think, I've had people say to me, well, isn't meditation? I'm not supposed to think. And I, and I tell them, no, <laughs> because if that's what, if, if you sit there and you, and you say, all right, I'm not supposed to think, and then a thought pops up, you're going to judge you're yourself, thinking. you're going to get that, you're going to say, oh my God, it's happening, it's not supposed to be happening, and then you're like yelling at yourself, stop, stop thinking, and the more thoughts come, because you're in resistance to it, so a way that I have found to be just really simple and practical, so there's two aspects to this, the first is the idea of a brain-heart coherence, mm -hmm. the body is not just, you know, chemical, let's say, it's electrical. And when you can measure the heart and the brain with a, an EKG for the heart, electrocardiogram and an EEG, electroencephalogram for the brain, it's these tools. And when you actually breathe a certain way, the, the, the two readings actually come into harmony. And when they're, when they're moving like that, the immune system boosts, you feel so much better, the peace and the calm is overwhelmingly beautiful. And so one way to do that is you breathe in through your nose, I'll use two different versions of it. One is a little bit easier. You breathe in for about four seconds, let's say through your nose, hold it for one second, and then exhale for six seconds. I prefer to do all of it through my nose. Some people say in through your nose, out through your mouth. It just depends on how you want to do it. But you do four, four in, hold one, six out. And you close your eyes and just focus on your breath. And as you breathe in, you can say it in your mind, in. And when you breathe out, you can just say out. And then when that feels easy, then you can raise it a little bit by doing six seconds in, hold for one, out for eight. The reason why the exhale is longer is it shifts the body, it shifts the nervous system into what we call a parasympathetic state, where it's more rest and relaxation, that's where you can heal. Mm -hmm. And so, so often when we've got medical challenges going on, our body's in this like sympathetic tension kind of state. And so excuse me, we're always on. And because we're on, the body's not really able to heal. When I say on, for everyone who's like hearing this, think about it like this. Back in the day, I make this distinction between new stress and old stress. <laughs> Back in the day, caveman times, you know, there you were foraging for berries and you were in a, you were slightly in your sympathetic state because you're looking around, you want to make sure everything's okay, but you're, you know, you're eating, you're foraging for stuff. And then you hear a twig snap and it's like a rabbit, the ears shoot up and you look, yeah, yeah, you look, and then you see like the hyena or the lion or whatever 
in the bushes looking at you and you take off and your body goes into full on sympathetic fight, flight, freeze. And you just, you're, you're running, let's say you're, you're in the, the flight <laughs> side of this. And the thing is that assuming you get away, that period of time, your body was 100%, all of our energy, send it to the muscles we need to get out of here. It's not, let's focus on fighting cancer. Let's focus on digesting your food. None of that matters if you're going to die in five seconds. You know, <laughs> So it's all about, let's get out of here. But then you get away and your system settles. And so most of the time, the system is either in a parasympathetic relaxed state or at least more of a neutral balanced state where more often than not, you're not in that sympathetic on state. But the world we live in now, even though for the, for the vast majority of us, that lion's not there, literally, it is there metaphorically because we treat our, my, our brains have not evolved with our technology. We got the same bodies that we did, you know, a couple million years ago. And so with that in mind, when you're stressing out about your finances, when you're in uh, traffic and you're getting some road rage, when, you know, your friend um, gives you a hard time or you had a breakup or, you know, having stress with your kids or you have health concerns, all that is the body's same response. There's a lion. And so the immune system is out of whack, the nervous system is out of whack, and the body has a, has a hard time healing. So when you can slow down and use one variation, let's say, of that meditation practice that I shared, you slow yourself down. And if you do it for 10, 15, 30 minutes, like Christine said, it's a gift that you give yourself where ideas are going to come to you, you're going to feel better, you're going to feel more calm and relaxed. And then I also love what you shared, I do this sometimes too, just visualizing, you know, what are you grateful for? And tuning in to all the good that's in your life. Because I think so often we focus on what's lacking, what's missing, what's broken, what's out of our control. And wherever your focus goes, that's what you're going to feel and experience. And so if you take a moment, five minutes, 10 minutes, one minute even, slow down, breathe, step into gratitude, see all the stuff you already have, see all the blessings that are already in your life, even if it's just, and just as in quotes, that you woke up today. You might think that nothing else is good is happening, but you woke up today and every day, 150,000 people can't say that. And so you have that gift of life today. And if you're alive, you can make changes. If you're alive, you can make your life better. And so I definitely would agree with Christine. Meditation is a wonderful practice to add in and it, it'll, it does wonders. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you practice yoga? So I, I do, but not in the, I guess, literal sense. And so for me, for, you, know, you practice one of the limbs. You practice a lot of the limbs. There's yeah. eight limbs. So yeah. yeah. And so the way I, I, I relate to it. So when I, when I lived in Arizona, I did a hot yoga a couple of times a week and that was really enjoyable. Um, when I moved back to New York, yoga for anyone listening means union. And when we think of union, a yogi is one who has essentially eliminated that barrier of separation of me and the rest of the world, me and the universe, me and God, me and the other people. And the yogi sees all as one, it's union. And so when I think of yoga, I strive to make my life yoga. I strive to make the way I relate to people, the way I relate to situations, the way I see myself and who I believe I really am. I look at that through that lens or filter, let's say of yoga, but I don't necessarily do the physical practices anymore. I sometimes do like a yoga flow as part of a stretch routine. It used to be every day, now it's probably like, once every two weeks, if I'm honest, <laughs> but, but it is, uh, it is a part of my life for sure. Yeah. Cause you were saying a couple of things that I was like, Oh, you, you were saying that the mind chatter is called like the tits of riches. So I was like, Oh, I wonder if he knows that they're, that they're called the tits of riches mm -hmm. and, um, the, that we always say, um, our issues wind up or our, our issues start in our tissues. Um, you said something about you said something about that because our physical yeah. body, you know, is the, the, our shell that we can, you know, feel and notice so much. Um, but yeah, I was just wondering if you did, you did yoga because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that you said that I was like, hmm, I think he is a yogi. <laughs> <laughs> Many of my mentors that um, I love, I love these people and getting to either read their books or watch them and experience them. And they're, the, the life philosophy, their spirituality, if you want to call it that, the way they see themselves in the world, you know, I've deeply studied their work and made it a part of me. And it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'm, I, I've had people, call, I, I'm a yogi in a different way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say, like a lot of people I know 
they feel like I can't meditate. They, I hear that a lot. I'm sure that you do too. Um, and there's so many great apps that you could do guided meditations too. It's just so beneficial to, to meditate. It, it really, you can see, you see a change in your day. If you start your day with it, just if you write it down, oh, I meditated today and then notice how that day was then on the day that you didn't meditate, you'll become a fan too, I think, you know? Yeah, you mentioned apps. And so there's one that I've used in the past called Insight Timer that oh. I know a lot of people have gotten benefit from. And there was one I used to um, recommend to patients when I was in medical school called Calm. Um, yeah, that's the one I was going to say, Calm. Yeah, and I, I, there's definitely a bunch more. But mm -hmm. it's amazing because, again, if, if silence is the challenge or if I can't get out of my thoughts, like Christine said, whether it's music and there's a mm -hmm. timer in the background, like with Inside Timer, or whether it's actually guided and someone's speaking and taking you through like a process, mm -hmm. you can go on YouTube even and type in, you know, guided meditations. Like right. the, they're everywhere. And if you were to do that, again, start small. I would definitely mm -hmm. implore everyone, don't fall into the story of, I tried that once and it didn't work for me, or I'm not good at that. Because the truth is, nobody who tried something once is good at it. And just because you tried it and it didn't work, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It means the way that you did it didn't work. And when right. we continue with that and say, okay, maybe it's a, I got to like ease into it. For example, I just actually, right before we uh, got on the call, I just got back from rock climbing. And I used to do that a fair amount when I lived in Arizona years ago. And got out of it for a couple of years. Recently, I had the opportunity on a visit to Arizona to do it once. And when I, when I came back to New York, I said, I got to find a place to do this. And, you know, there's all these different holds indoors uh, on, the, on the wall, and they go from fairly easy to really, really difficult. And when I first started, I said, all right, you know, I'm going to start with the easy ones and I'll work my way up. First day, I did two, three of the easiest ones. And then when I go back again, it's like, all right, I start with that. And instead of it being like, hesitant and tentative because I don't want to fall I just shot right up it because I know like I can do that and then I get mm -hmm. to the, the the more difficult ones really challenging can barely get get even hold myself on the wall because the holes are so small and then when I went today that same one that was so challenging that I couldn't get 10 percent up the wall I got 80 percent up the wall today and so it's just if I come from that space of oh I, it didn't work great for me today. I guess I'm just not a rock climber. I wasn't born with that gift. Right. Nobody is. And so when you realize you can be, if you want to, in your mind, see it as the world's worst meditator, that can be very different in a week. That can be very different in a month and in a year and in a decade. And you might find, like Christine said, it's like an invaluable practice that on the days that you do it and the days you don't, you see a massive difference in you know maybe your temper or maybe your patience or your willingness mm -hmm. to just experience life and let it wash yeah, over. It and mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, you know, this podcast, the idea of it is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret, given your life experience, the things that you've learned along the way, what advice would you give someone to create an extraordinary life without regret? How could they do that? I would say that, like to really decide how you want to feel and are you feeling that way do you want to live healthy and do you want to thrive into you know 60 70 80 years old um 90 my great grandmother lived to 99 so i really hope i make it past 100 yeah and i want to feel good you know and so i think it's a choice it really is a choice of how you're going to live and once you become aware what are you going to choose next? And, and these tools, the, these small tools of holistic living, however you're choosing to do that, can help you do that. Mm. Yeah, when I lived in Arizona, there was a man, I didn't, get the, I didn't get the opportunity to meet him, unfortunately, but one of my teachers did. And he passed away, I think in 2015, when I was mm -hmm. the second year, and he was 114 years old. And he was, I think he was the oldest man in the United States. And um, I think some people were saying it was unofficial because they couldn't get a birth certificate. But 1901 is when he was born. Yeah. And the guy's incredible. And he had a book, and he still does. And you look at this man, and it's like you said, health is a choice. And it's like the choices that he was making day by day. Now, 
somebody might be hearing what I just said and that might trigger them because they might feel really sick right now and they might feel like they're really hurting. And to hear yeah. someone say health is a choice, it might feel like, well, I'm not choosing to be sick. And I'm not saying it at all with any disrespect or any way of thinking it's a blame or a shame or it's a guilt. So if that's how it's being taken, please forgive me. And that's not where I mean to come from. But when I say at least health is a choice, it's the things that you eat, the way that you breathe, let's say you might choose to meditate or not, different stress reduction kind of practices, the way you choose to see the world, the way life happens, and then the way you choose to respond, the meaning you choose to create, your outlook, the, you know, the, if you're able to be mobile and walk around, maybe you can't do a marathon, but maybe you can walk. And so it's like, are you doing those things? Like, are you starting small with what you have? And if every day you make those choices, this is coming to mind right now. There's a really inspiring video that goes with this. If you were to go on YouTube and type in D, like dog, DDPY yoga, Arthur transformation. And DDPY yoga is a guy named Diamond Dallas Page. He was a wrestler uh, years ago. I think he wrecked his back and he used yoga to get, get back his health. And he created this whole program. And so the, if you watch the video, there's this like nine, 10 minute transformation where you watch this guy who is significantly overweight. He was injured in, um, he used to be in the military and he was injured um, doing like parachute and like falling on the ground and big he had a cane, he could barely move. He joins this guy's yoga program and you see in nine, 10 minutes, his transformation, he goes from barely able to walk and significantly overweight to sprinting, thin, healthy, all in a matter of, I think, 18 months or something like that. Wow. And he says throughout the video, just because I can't do it today, it being he's trying to do these yoga poses and he can't balance and he's falling. He's like, just because I can't do it today doesn't mean I won't be able to do it someday. Mm -hmm. And just coming from that space, every time I've watched that or shown that to somebody, I always show it from that space of, I get that you think you're gone. Like you're, 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 it's too late for you. And you think right. given where you're at, nothing's going to work. But this guy thought that too. And in the beginning of that video, you might agree. And mm -hmm. then when you watch it, you see it and you go, if you could do that, 18 months could feel like a long time. You know, if, if you're starting today, that's a lot of months. <laughs> and at the same time, the journey is absolutely worth it. And so if we come back to that space of my health is a choice and what am I doing every day to choose me and to choose health? You know, I think it was Dr. Mark Hyman. He's a functional medicine practitioner. And he said, Whenever you put food in your mouth, you're basically voting for health or for disease. Mm -hmm. And like, obviously food is only one component that, of health, but it's still accurate. And so when you come from that space, there is always a choice. It's never too late. If you're listening, if you're alive right now, you can make changes. And it's incredible mm -hmm. that every year, your body's brand new. A lot of people don't know that. It used to be, the research used to show every like seven to 10 years, and then we actually see now it's actually every year. You have a new skeleton every year. You have new skin, like there's multiple layers of skin, but you have a new mm -hmm. layer every four weeks. Mm -hmm. GI systems every four days or so. You got things that are changing over in, in minutes or hours or days. Everything's always renewing itself. But what do you think it's renewing itself with? With what you're putting in. And mm -hmm. so if you start putting the good stuff in and then you do the good practices over time, the new stuff starts to take over. And then mm -hmm. as the mind and the emotions shift and as the body shift, it really feels like a whole new you. It's a whole new body. And that to me is a very hopeful, it's not even like a concept, it's a fact. So that's a very hopeful fact that if people latch onto and live into, give it 90 days, give it six yeah. months and let's see what happens. And if you Agreed. feel better, keep it going. <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, I know personally, like when I have been in that space of feeling so sick and terrible, it's, it's almost easier to stay in that darkness though. Like it takes a lot to remember your own light, but meditating will remind you. And if you keep going back into your heart space and, and just that belief and that hope and know that it's there, you'll keep that, um, I want to say, I don't know what, what, how, what word I'm looking for, but to know that your own inner light is always with you. Mm 
-hmm. and that sometimes you just forget. And when you forget, that's okay. Forgive yourself. You're human. You'll forget and you'll remember and you'll forget and you'll remember. And it's kind of that dance that you'll do your whole life, but that you have that tool inside. Yeah, something really cool for anyone's watching on video. And if it's audio only, I'll explain this. But as Christine's talking about the light, the way the sun's hitting her, there's this like this angelic <laughs> light. It's like coming off of the whole time she's saying that, which is really cool. And as it relates to, you talked about, it can be really challenging for some people to want to make those changes. And I feel that one of the aspects of it has to do with the distinction or the contrast between hope and hopelessness. When someone's in a space of feeling hopeless, they believe that the future won't be any better than the present and that the present kind of sucks. And so because they don't like it, it's like, what's the point? It's kind of hopeless. Now, hope has three aspects to it. The first is you believe the future can be better than the present. And given what you know, I just shared about how your body's always becoming brand new and what Christine's talked about as well in her life journey, and she went from sick to feeling significantly better. And she went from like, I can barely walk till I get to go on these nice, beautiful, long walks. And the Arthur video that I just talked about, and you see the, the, sh the change in this guy's life. And I'm sure most of us, if we really thought about it, we know at least one person who's made some significant change in their life, whether they went from smoking like crazy to not smoking, or they lost a lot of weight, or they made a big change in some various aspect of their life, whether it was financially or relationally or something. If others can do it, it's a signal and a sign that you probably can too. And when we realize, okay, step one, the future can be better than the present. If I've got that, that creates a, like a light at the end of the tunnel. There's some degree of hope. Then the second uh, spot of hope is about agency. The idea that I could actually do it. And then the third is this idea that, um, hold on, <laughs> as a third one just leaves me, but we've got number one, Future can be better than the past. Oh yeah, okay. Number two is agency that I can actually do it. And number three is that I actually have pathways for success. I actually mm -hmm. have a couple of different strategies. Of, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do that. And now it, it becomes easier. That's why I mentioned earlier, whether it be you're on YouTube watching some guided meditations or whether it be you're working with some um, you know, functional or naturopathic or Ayurvedic or some type of holistic health practitioner that's able to give you the feedback, this is where you're at right now. This is the plan of action to get you where you want to be. And you see that and you can even ask them, hey, have you worked with people who have, who've had something like this before? Could you tell me about some of their stories? And now you're getting that hope. You're getting that excitement of, oh, wow, other people have gotten better from this too. And just by realizing that, well, maybe it could happen to me too. And I can take the action. You empower yourself. And then you have the plan. These are the four or five things I'll be doing every day, every week. And then we're going to check in in 90 days. Mm -hmm. Again, you follow that. It's incredible how different your life can be. Yeah. And then, you know, you have those tools. So when you do slip up, your bounce back time is shorter, you yes. know, and just to know that, like, that's, that's a very hopeful thing too. <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny too. It's like, uh, I just, you bounce back. I just made that connection, like the rock climbing connection of yeah. I've been watching these people climbing and they're hooked into the wall. So if they fall, they're okay. And they climb, they climb, they climb. And then they're at that point where they have to really reach for it. And then they jump and they don't make it and they fall. <laughs> but then they bounce back faster because they, they know the route up until that point. Right, right. You know, so if you fall, you get back up. It's just a part of, it's a part of life. And so right. something I'd love to ask you, Christine, if you were in your final moments and this was your last opportunity to share and help anyone listening, what would you want to make sure they know? I would say to choose you, that you are worth it. Mm, I love that. Absolutely. I second that. <laughs> choose <Yeah>. you. <laughs> You're absolutely worth it. And again, you know, if you don't choose you, no one else can. You know, like you need to choose you and you need to have that and I use need in quotes, but it's like, you know, you don't need to do anything, but you need to choose you, you choose yeah. yourself and you say, okay, I'm worth it. And if I take care of myself, it's not just me, expand it. Maybe you have kids. Maybe you've got people that rely on you at work. Maybe you've got friends. I remember hearing uh, Abraham Lincoln, you know, he ran for office many times and he lost. I think it was like 15 or 16 times. And one time uh, after he won presidency, somebody said to him, what 
helped you keep going. Like, why didn't you quit? And he said, well, I had a, he said, I had a friend who was counting on me and I didn't have the heart to let him down. You know, there's, an, there's this idea that people are willing to do more, more, yeah. more, more times than not for the people that they care about than just themselves. So right. maybe, I think when we heal, we heal others. You know, we yeah. don't only heal ourselves. Yeah, it's very expansive. Yeah, so because we're it's it's a collective. It's you know we're all connected in some way. Yeah, so maybe you want to lose weight. Maybe you want to quit smoking. Maybe you want to you know you want to get your health back if it really seems like it's been out of balance. But you sit there and you say, okay, whatever the the thing that's going on is, who would benefit other than me? from me getting my, my body back in order, from me getting my life from you know rags to riches, metaphorically, from where, I, from where I don't want to be to where I do want to be. And maybe, again, if you have kids, I've seen this so powerfully play out where people, maybe they want to quit smoking and they've tried everything, but the moment they can associate the smoking with maybe them not being there for their kids later on in life, and they see that by getting off of it and getting healthier, all the beautiful memories they'll be able to share in the future, it becomes significantly easier when before it was just about them. And mm -hmm. so you might use that as a little hack. It's almost who else is counting on me? Who else's life would benefit if I, if I did this? And it makes it so much, so much easier. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I always, one of the things I always say is I want my kids to be proud of me. So mm -hmm. um, that really, I understand where you're coming from when you say that it makes a lot of sense totally resonates with me. I love that. I love that you said that. That's something that I told actually a client of mine last week. And it's this idea of, yeah. you know, his kids are so important to him and just mm -hmm. sharing because he wants to improve all these different areas of his life. But one aspect is being a better dad. And it's like from that headspace, okay, here's this thing that you're thinking about doing. Would your kids be proud of you? Would you, would this be what the version of you who's the better dad, is that what he would do? Mm -hmm. And it's just a simple framework that when you come from that space, it's an easy yes or no. And if you, right. once you know the answer, act accordingly. Mm -hmm. And it changes everything. It does. And so yeah. as we begin to wrap up, Christine, could you share with us what is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? Hmm, biggest risk. Um, I, I would say forgiveness forgiving um forgiveness for the 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 people that misdiagnosed me i mean i had a, i had a lot of trauma that we didn't go into today but it also goes to what i was talking about being in the darkness and I feel like forgiveness really goes hand in hand with that because if you if you're not open opening your heart and forgiving others you really do stay in that dark place and it is easier to to be angry I think for a lot of people um and I really feel like forgiveness is a is a huge component to healing yourself because your spirit can't be healthy if it's if it's not in that forgiving loving state yeah absolutely i have seen that in a variety of aspects of the work i do with people whether it be mental and emotional release work or the energy healing forgiveness for a lot of people they almost get triggered by it because they think that if i forgive this person who in their perspective really wronged me that somehow I'm making it okay. And the mm -hmm. thing is that at least from my perspective, forgiveness is not about what that person did was okay. Forgiveness right. is saying that I am no longer gonna allow the present version of me to be a prisoner to the past. I'm gonna mm -hmm. let go of what's no longer happening right now because up until this point, it's been chaining me. It's been imprisoning me and preventing me from, from you know, flying metaphorically, from being that version mm -hmm. of me that I really wanna be. And so you're not forgiving them, you're forgiving yourself for holding on for so long. You're forgiving mm -hmm. yourself and being willing to let go. And then and I like to kind of couple it with this idea of, you know, when you think about the most loving, uh, compassionate, understanding people, they're not going out there hurting people. 
It's, mm -hmm. you know, there's an expression, hurt people, hurt people. And so when we realize that, wow, that person, whoever, that person who did something to me, in their mind, either they didn't think they did anything wrong, or mm -hmm. they didn't know to the extent mm -hmm. of how whatever they did and how it affected you. And even if they did know, and even if it was malicious and intentional, imagine the mindset and the heart space you'd have to be in to do that to another human being. And that's where I think compassion arises, where again, we're not forgiving the action, but we get to that space of, it's not about condoning, but if I can come from the space of, okay, here's this thing I've been holding on to for days, months, years, decades, that's really been, and this kind of brings it full circle to what I was sharing about the nervous system. Sometimes that resentment, that grudge that you hold on to, that's the reason why you down the line you get some type of autoimmune condition or cancer or something, yeah. not the sole reason, but it can play a major part because the mm -hmm. way the nervous system is now stuck in that fight or flight state because your brain's always in that state of tension. And so what would happen if you say, okay, let me take a breath, let me do my meditation, like I said earlier, let me calm myself, let me get a clear kind of vantage point. Here's this thing that happened, it's not happening anymore. I have been kind of miserable because of what's happened but the reality is there's a difference between pain and suffering. Pain is what's actually happening. Suffering is the story we make up about what happened. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm suffering about something that hasn't happened in a long time, it's in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's not like it's all in your head kind of thing. Like, I don't like that perspective, but just the idea that it's in our mind and that it's a creation. So if I can mm -hmm. say, you know what, I'm going to let this go. I'm going to forgive myself for holding on for so long because that's caused me pain. I'm going to free myself from that. And then if you can go a step further, I'm going to give forgiveness and compassion to the other person because, wow, in order for them to do that to me, they must have been hurting. They must have been in a really ignorant space. They must have been in a space that I don't wish on anybody. And I hope they find peace. I hope they find forgiveness. I hope they find love and happiness. If, and it might be a stretch to get to that point, depending on where you're at right now. But if and when you do get to that point, the release that you feel it's as if the weight of the world is off your shoulders. It's as if it happened and it's okay. Not what happened was okay, but it happened. It's in the past okay. and you're okay now. And because acceptance. you're okay now, you can move forward. Yeah. Right. Acceptance is a huge thing. You know, accepting what happened and, and just then living in the present moment, just like you said. Mm. Earlier, you mentioned, uh, you talked about the doshas. And I understand mm -hmm. you have a dosha quiz. Can you share that with our audience? I do. You can um, go to my website and shoot me an email at ignitedgoddess at gmail.com. And I'll send you a complimentary dosha quiz. It's fun. And you can find out what you're dominant in. Mm. And then um, I will share the results with you. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah, I definitely recommend everyone take advantage of that. Um, it's been a long time. At one point, I did do one of those quizzes, but okay. it's so cool that in any of these kind of um, quizzes, you know, you learn more about yourself and you find mm -hmm. out, like you talked about the balance and the harmony. And it's like, okay, given the way the questions were answered, given your symptoms, given all this, the way your body is present, you're presenting, you'd probably benefit from these four or five things. And you, these four, four or five, you probably should avoid those. <laughs> and right, right. often you go, oh, those things I shouldn't be avoiding, I'm doing those every day. And then sometimes just a quiz like this can turn your whole life around in the short term because you feel so much better identifying what should be happening and what shouldn't be happening. Right, right. So one thing I'll tell you about, if you're going to do this quiz, decide if you're doing it, what your property is, which is how you were born. And that will be like how you were when you were growing up. Or if you want to see if you're out of balance, you can do all of the questions that way. And that will be your vikriti, which is the imbalance in your body. Mm, perfect. And that's what happens. We all get imbalanced because life, we're, we're living life, you know, <laughs> and life happens. So perfect. And you mentioned that people can get that quiz on your website, correct? Yes. Yes. Just shoot perfect. me an email, go to my website, shoot me an email right on there and I'll shoot it over to you. Perfect. I'll have the links to that in the show notes. And as we wrap up here, what are you excited about now that you're working on? Well, I have a 21-day 
another 21 day um, journey coming up for eight to 10 women in September. We, I did a bunch of them and um, then took a couple months off because it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, I was doing two of them a month because they're fun. I love them, but it's a lot of, um, a lot of energy output, should I say. So now I have one coming up in September and I'm really excited about doing it again because it's super fun. We have different kinds of yoga classes and you get an Ayurvedic consultation and we do a cooking class and a beauty night and a visioning night, which is really fun. Um, so I'm excited that that's coming up and you could also inquire more about that on my website. Perfect. And so for the, our listeners who want to connect with you outside of the website and the email, is there any other uh, ways you'd like to share or is those two are the primary? Uh, sure. Instagram. Um, it's Ignited Goddess um, on Instagram. Perfect. I'll have everything in the show notes to connect with Christine. For everyone listening, if you enjoyed our conversation, I really encourage you to please leave a review, whether it be on Spotify or Apple, wherever you're listening, really goes a long way. And it encourages other people to check out the shows and really get the value that you're receiving. Uh, Christine, is there anything you'd like to say before we close? No, I just want to say how much fun I had. I really enjoyed being here and connecting with you. And so happy. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And as I said at the start, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers experience more happiness, peace, and fulfillment as they create an extraordinary life without regret. If I could be of further service to you, whether it be a, an actual conversation to see what's going on in your world right now, where you'd like to be, and if I can help you get there, you can do that at jamilsayage.com and schedule a call. If you want to listen to other episodes of the podcast, obviously, wherever you're tuning into this, <laughs> but you can look up Transformation Starts Today. You can also go on my Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayage, D-R, and then my name or Facebook and LinkedIn is just at Jamil Sayage. There's about 800 something pieces of content that have been put out over the years that people have, have been really fortunate and blessed to hear people's getting, getting so much value from it. And that's all available to you for free. And so thank you again so much, Christine. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. And like we said earlier, choose you, you're worth it. Take actions, however small, in the direction that you wanna be knowing the future can be better than the past and you'll be really happy that you did. Wishing you the best. All my love. Take care. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.